Of all of the discoveries that I made in 2022, one that's really stuck with me is Ethel Kane. For those of you unaware of Kane, she is an emerging indie pop star whose ethereal pop has caught the notice of the likes of President Obama, who hilariously listed the anti-war pop satire, American Teenager, amongst his favorite songs of last year. She had him gagged a little, let's be real. Additionally, Kane famously joked that she would rally the Amish against Drake on Twitter after he dissed Megan the Stallion on Circo Loco. Kane is making a name for herself. In 2023, she's going to open for Caroline Polachek on her tour and have her own Coachella set. In this video, I'm going to talk about her early career, speak on her debut, Preacher's Daughter, and parse out why I think Think she might be one of Gen Z's most defining artists in the coming years. While most of us found her in the last year, Kane has actually been developing music since 2017. Hayden Anadonia, the mastermind and voice behind the Ethel Kane persona, released music under different names at first. Finding the earlier demos and work she released under the name White Silas was personally a surprise to me. The Gregorian chant slash Christian music inspired slant with clear pop DNA was always there. But under the White Silas moniker, Kane released some pretty eclectic, amazing stuff. One particular song I love is Saddle Up, which veers closer to Witch Trap House and Hyperpop than anything else. The Ethel Kane persona, as we know it, came to be when she released the song Bruises, which was followed shortly after by Carpet Bed, her first EP. While not as ornamented or sophisticated as her later material, the songwriting and production here very much served as a prelude to Preacher's Daughter. My highlight off that EP has to be Miss You So, which is a play on the phrase I miss you so. It leans into the Gregorian sound that Kane would later come to master. Just months later, her second EP, Golden Age, showcased a stronger understanding of melody and songwriting structure. Carpet Bed always felt more like a collection of songs and ideas, where Golden Age seemed to tell a more coherent story about lost love and the damage that life deals someone when faced with hopeless circumstances and the sins of their forefathers. I found it neat that American Teenager actually samples the opening track of that EP, Sunday Morning. My personal highlight off that record is Head in the Wall, which is a stunning atmospheric piece about trauma, and processing grief over a gorgeous guitar loop sampling title flights head in the ceiling. Golden Age was what drew the attention of Little Aaron, who would sign her on to Prescription Songs, one of the biggest publishing companies in the industry, unfortunately run by Dr. Luke, but that's another story for another time. Kane would eventually relocate from Florida to a refurbished church in Indiana to record Inbred, her first EP with Prescription Songs. Inbred dropped in 2021, and it features both Little Aaron and Wicca Faye's Springs Eternal. It is the first release from her own label, Daughters of Cain. Quick aside, I love to see young artists own their own music. Inbred raised the stakes, solidifying her hold on the dream pop space with edgy cutting lyrics about heavy topics. It definitely feels more like a prequel to Preacher's Daughter, not quite telling Ethel's story, but clearly giving us sketches into lamentations about the crushing narrow life that a deeply Baptist upbringing deals. Her debut single, Michelle Pfeiffer, with Little Aaron, posits a Thelma and Louise love story. Another track from Inbred Crush details a thrilling infatuation with a man on the run from the law, perpetuating an unbreakable chain of intergenerational violence and defiance. My personal favorite was God's Country, with its dueling verses between her and Wicca Faye's Springs Eternal, with its guitar solos and haunting incantations over church organs. Inbred really did set the stage for Preacher's Daughter. For my own personal reasons, I consider her album, starting with Preacher's Daughter, New Testament Ethel Kane. Though I found Preacher's Daughter after it was released, I do want to point out that it had three singles before it dropped. The first single was Gibson Girl, which shocks me in retrospect considering its role in the complete story of the record. The track infamously draws comparisons to early Lana Del Rey, particularly the ultraviolence era due to its composition and subject matter. The second single, Strangers, is the album's last track and closing coda to the story, yet another odd decision. 
And the final single was American Teenager, which I briefly talked about in both of my Best of 2022 videos. It was the only song to receive a proper music video. I feel like I can't dive into the music without talking about the overarching story behind the record. Preacher's Daughter recounts the story of the fictional Ethel Kane as told through a thread retweeted by Mother Kane herself from the user Delanchis transcribed from one of Kane's friend's writings on the Genius page. Essentially, it goes like this. In 1991, the fictional Ethel Kane, the titular preacher's daughter, goes through a profound journey that leads to her kidnapping and murder. Kane laments the loss of her youth. She is mourning the departure of Willoughby Tucker, her ex-lover who skipped town, and how she longs to not be in Shady Grove, Alabama, her hometown anymore. She dreams of living with him somewhere in Nebraska. Ethel shortly falls in love with a new man, Logan Phelps, who is very violent with her and not the man Willoughby is. Logan passes away after a failed bank robbery, and the shootout that follows after. Ethel ends up on the lam. While on the run, she laments the damage her beloved father inflicted on her and her feelings about him. Her fortune seems to turn for the better when she meets Isaiah, who offers her a ride. They drive from Texas to California, and they fall in love. However, it's not meant to be because Isaiah starts to pimp her out and drugs her. She's forced to undergo a journey where she decides to run away, only to be caught and murdered. Ethel ascends to heaven, and the last two tracks serve as her final farewells and thoughts. Her regrets about Willoughby and her urging her mother to really just move on rather than worry. Yeah, that insanely beautiful future indie movie masterpiece plot is all in there. Just waiting for the casual listener to uncover. I was not aware of any of the lore on my first blind listen where I ignorantly just assumed that she was the Amish's Lana Del Rey. But upon learning the story, each track becomes a whole different piece of art in my mind. American Teenager transforms from an oddball pop confection to Kane's equivalent of a Disney Princess I Want song mixed with the sobering realities of life in the American South. A house in Nebraska becomes a tale of longing perhaps the last true daydream in Kane's life before tragedy after tragedy hits her. Family Tree was already one of my favorite tracks, but upon learning its place in the story, the imagery of Kane on the run licking her wounds and referencing the intro of the album itself, I now interpret the guitar solo outro as her embrace into the coming darkness caused by her traumatic past. My personal favorite track, Thoroughfare, this nearly 10 minute long country epic about falling in love and traveling the country, becomes the antebellum equivalent of Frozen's Love is an Open Door, an innocuous seeming track that spells its heroine's doom. In spite of that implication, the cathartic nature of the track, perhaps the last grasp at joy that Kane's narrator gets in her life, makes it an utter triumph, the impromptu scatting at the end with the tambourine being an intimate display of euphoric joy. Tolomania, another highlight and fan favorite, showcases Kane's ability to make metal music. It's named after the ninth circle of hell in Dante's Inferno, a space dedicated to traitors. The implication of who the traitors are is fascinating. Isaiah himself is a traitor who sells Kane out, but Kane herself feels like abandoning her duties imparted on her as the preacher's daughter and her religion and the community that she had is treachery in its own right, and that her awful end to her life is what she's reaping after she sowed. The album contains two instrumental tracks, August Underground and Televangelism, the former being the crunchy soundtrack to Ethel's demise and the latter being her ascension into what might be considered heaven. Televangelism being a stripped down angelic almost theatrical coda. Sunbleach Flies is a beautiful piano rock anthem which possesses one of my all-time favorite lyrics from Kane, God loves you but not enough to save you. Ethel revealed in an interview that this lyric comes from the early pandemic and her thoughts about the world at the time. It's insanely powerful, nihilistic, but also a challenge for God to show and not tell Kane that it loves her. The chorus further interplays on that theme, positing that her prayers were unanswered, but she still resolves to ask in a human moment of humility and realization that she's at the mercy of uninterested forces, but the bridge strikes me the most, where she finally abandons and forgives to end the cycle of trauma that she's carried her entire life. The outro is a callback to A House in Nebraska, where we learn that in her final moments, she still longs for Willoughby, 
and the future that she wanted with him. Strangers contextualize as a finale is perfect. Only Ethel can make a song about being eaten alive sound this beautiful and oddly hopeful. It feels as if it's a eulogy from a spirit that's really looking down on us. The verses detail the brutality of how she has no remains left on this earth, no physical proof of her existence. The bridge being an explosive question to Isaiah if she's literally making him sick as she rests in his stomach, but it also serves as a rhetorical question to her audience. It's a pretty intense bridge with the guitars really hammering the points, but again, Kane's mastery in her outro where she sees her father not in heaven nor in hell, but the afterlife itself, and forgives him before giving her mother assurance that one day they'll all be united together. Just truly powerful stuff. On a thematic level, Preacher's Daughter has to be one of the most interesting queer texts I've ever encountered about religion. It speaks power to the oppressive nature and bonds that we form with organized religion and the community. It also has the nuance to say that the sudden absence of it and the isolation one faces is just as deadly as being crushed alive by it. It's bleak in posing that romance itself won't save a person either. Isaiah was going to be her savior, but ended up becoming an oppressor in the process. What's most chilling yet authentic about this record is how unafraid it is to not provide answers. If religion, love, and hope cannot save you, what can? Yet it still implies that the narrator found salvation somehow by an unseen, unheard miracle or realization. It's a tragedy for the ages, and I'm not even accounting for the additional context of Cain and her narrator being trans women. Viewing all of these themes from that lens essentially roots the album and the narrative in a way that is even more grounded and tragic and real. Rather than end the video on a bleak note like that, I do want to talk about Kane's delightful presence online. On top of her stunning work, Kane's interactions with her fans are just as rewarding as the music she makes herself. Seeing her respond to memes about her working at Panera Bread and telling Liza Minnelli that she's about to quit, to rallying the Amish against Drake, to openly accepting the title of mother to fans much older than her, it's moments like these that foster and build a fan base. Between the talent and the charisma Kane already possesses, the sky is the limit. Ethel Kane honestly makes me feel happy about the state of music. In a world where artists are making shorter songs and jingles, Kane's out here creating long epics akin to post-NFR Lana Del Rey and the greats from the past. All while finding the space to share her identity and experiences and her personality to the world. Consider me a part of Mother Kane's congregation of queers and fans. And that just about wraps up this video. This is the first video of 2023 that I made. I know I am late to the Ethel Kane party, but I just felt like I needed to channel my thoughts about this beautiful record together. I want to give a quick shout out to my members. Thank you for supporting me. I will be back with more videos towards the end of the month. I just took a quick break. I will continue live streams relatively soon. So drop albums that you want me to listen with you on live streams. Comment below how you feel about Ethel Kane, if you like her or not, how you feel about her music, and feel free to drop artists that you want me to cover. Like, subscribe, comment, you know the drill. Thank you so much for watching.